Sadly, a lot of logistics outsourcing contracts go wrong. The relationship falls apart and neither party gets what they expected out of that relationship. And why is that? Do you think it's the 3PL's fault, third party logistics company, or the customer's fault? Well, the blame can be split. And this week, we're talking about things that the customer gets wrong quite often. Coming right up. So recently, I shared a video on outsourcing about some of the things that 3PLs, third party logistics companies, get wrong when they're bidding for outsourcing contracts. So to balance things up a little bit, I thought this week I should talk about the stuff that clients very often get wrong, the customers of the 3PLs. And, you know, having been involved in hundreds of outsourcing projects over the last 23 years, if someone were to say to me, when it goes wrong, really, who's to blame? Is it the 3PLs who screw it up or is it the customers who screw it up? I'd say it's 50-50, to be honest. Um, and so let's stop the finger pointing and try and find out what some of the issues are. So what do customers get wrong? I know if you want the uh, the 3PL tips, I'll put a link to that up here and you can watch that. In fact, where does it go? It goes there, I think. My editor will stick it up there. So that was the video about things that 3PLs get wrong. This week, we're going to talk about what do the customers get wrong when they're outsourcing. So in no particular order, let me run through a few. Number one, timing. Very often, a lot of companies will think, OK, we're going to uh, think about outsourcing our logistics or maybe um, for some reason we'd like to change service providers. And so we're going to go through an outsourcing process, an RFT or an RFP. And they think about it and they think about it and they talk about it. And then finally, when they get around to doing it, it's all a bit of a rush because ah, we, we want to know the result by year end or by Christmas or, you know, there's some sort of artificial deadline in place there or, or it might be, you know, leases expiring or something like that. And they've procrastinated to the extent where there isn't enough time left realistically to go through the process. Um, and that's really not fair. It's not fair on the client's team, the customer's team, it's not fair on the 3PLs. So how long should you leave? Well, that's the $64,000 question. Um, for a really simple, you know, warehousing, outsourcing assignment, um, RFT, I'd be allowing probably three weeks for the service providers to come back with their bids. So when I'm talking about timing, you've obviously got to prepare the documentation. You've got to distribute that documentation to your, your long list of potential providers. Uh, you've got to allow time for them to put their bids together. You've got to allow time to evaluate it. You've, you've then got to you know, get into negotiations. So it's quite an extended time frame. Where people get the time frame wrong, mainly, is the amount of time they give for the service provider to put their bids together. So what I'm saying is three weeks minimum for a simple warehousing contract. Um, it could be you know, two, three months for a much more complex um, solution, maybe multiple warehouses and transport, you know, it could be even longer, four, five, six months. Uh, I've been involved in uh, 3PL contracts worth, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars, um, which were very complicated. And you've got to think, you know, the 3PL is going to take quite a while to put this together. So don't be unrealistic uh, and give people enough time to put their solution together, put their resourcing and costing together and so on. So number one is timing. Probably the second biggest mistake I see the customer make is around data. And just think of it from the 3PL's point of view for a minute. The 3PL basically has to design a solution for you, whether that be warehousing or freight, managing your inventory, whatever it might be. And they need a fair amount of data to be able to do that. They've got to design the solution. They've got to work out the, the resources required, you know, people, equipment, facilities, systems. Um, they've got to cost all of that. They've got to do some sensitivity analysis on it. That means they, they need some fairly detailed data on, uh, you know, your, your demand profile, going out to your customers, who your customers are, where they are, if it's for distribution, how many orders are being processed, you know, lines per order, items per order, all that kind of thing. Um, returns, uh, product master files, customer master files. There's a lot of data that you need to be able to design that solution. And I still see some 
potential 3PL customers really not appreciating that and not providing enough data or the level of detail in the data or the accuracy in the data. Uh, and I spoke about this on a, on a video last year, I think, where one particular customer had decided, look, our data is really rubbish. We're not going to be able to provide something accurate. Uh, and so we had to work out ways to get around that. You, you, you know, there are ways of creating synthetic data, which are fairly representative of the real data. Um, the other ways, of course, are to allow the 3PLs access to your facilities and you know, so they can get around and see what's happening. So data is really important. Bad data means that the 3PL has to make lots of assumptions, which means they have to kind of mitigate the potential risk of that so they might be putting in some extra cost and so on to cover that. So bad data means for you as the customer, your solution might not be appropriate and the cost could be higher than expected. So get the data right. Uh, number three is probably who to approach. Um, you know, if you haven't gone through outsourcing before, who do you approach in the marketplace? Do you do a public tender? Um, some government departments and uh, government organizations need to do that for, for um, you know, disclosure purposes and to make sure fairness and all that sort of thing. Um, for commercial organizations, I'd suggest that's never really a good thing. You're going to get inundated with responses uh, from a lot of companies that are really not appropriate uh, for your business, for, your, for the service that you're looking for. So I would say be an educated buyer. Do your research. Um, you know, get it down to a few companies who you think are really well suited to your business in terms of your industry, the types of products, the types of services that, that you're seeking. How many? <laughs> Look, if you want to put me on the spot, let me re reverse engineer that. Um, I always like to end up with a short list of potential providers who absolutely can meet your needs of three. So if we're going to end the whole RFT process and we reach the evaluation stage with having three really viable contenders, you know, that's a good outcome. Sometimes it might only be two. But if we're going to end up with three, how many do you need to start with? It might be five or six. Um, and there's always the opportunity there to allow in an outsider, maybe a new market entry or somebody that you don't have a lot of experience with, but you've heard they're doing good things. Um, so maybe five or six. Do you go to 20? No, that's just wasting people's time. Um, and if it gets out in the marketplace that you've been approaching 23 PLs, you know, during an RFT, they're not going to take you seriously. So be a serious, educated buyer, I would say. Uh, number four, communication. Keep up the communications, and I mentioned this on the 3PL version of this video as well, a couple of weeks back. Um, so make sure that you're communicating everything that's happening through the RFT process, you know, what critical deadlines are, how you're going to be assessing people. Uh, try to make it as easy as possible for the 3PL in the way that you structure your RFT or RFP, whatever you're calling it. Um, and make it easy for them to understand what you need and, and what you need in the response and, and and that will make the evaluation easier as well. Number five is clarity. Um, be very clear. It kind of goes with the communication. Be very clear to the 3PLs what you're aiming for as an outcome. Uh, what are you hoping to achieve going through this RFT process? And, and that counts not just for the 3PLs, but internally as well, so that everybody knows you know, what, what's the real agenda here? What are we trying to achieve? If it's cost cutting, then, you know, say that. Um, if it's service improvement, say that. You know, if it's access to uh, better technologies and systems and so on, say that. Um, and that kind of links in with my last point, number six, the reason for outsourcing. Now, you might wonder, why did I put this uh, number six and not number one? People generally don't get this wrong, but they sometimes do. So be very Put a lot of thought in it right up front, particularly if you're moving from in-house to outsourced logistics. Why are you doing it? What's the reason behind it? What's the main driver? And if it is to reduce cost, a word of caution, outsourcing doesn't always reduce cost. It's not one of the primary reasons to do it. Um, there are many, many val very valid reasons to do it. Access to expertise, to technologies, to, to infrastructure, um, to you know, experience and so on. All of these are very good reasons to outsource. Um, you know, what percentage of companies outsource logistics and save money? Uh, it would be hard to put a, a number on it, maybe 20, 30%, but they were probably very inefficient beforehand. So 
be very clear what the primary reason is for outsourcing your logistics um, and make sure that that sits well with the business and the, and the senior executives in the business. Is this a good reason to outsource? And coupled with that, exactly what is it that you're going to outsource? Is it the warehousing? Is it the transport? Is it the inventory management? Is it the returns? Is it the customer service? You know, so be, be very clear on what you're outsourcing and why. Okay, I could probably come up with another dozen things that the, the customer side generally get wrong, uh, but maybe you'd like to comment below in the video and, and share some of the ones that you think I've missed. Uh, those were just you know six clear ones that I see time and time again. So remember what I said at the beginning of this video, when logistics outsourcing relationships go wrong, whose fault is it? Is it the 3PL or the customer? In my experience, the blame is fairly equally shared. So thanks for watching and uh, if you are new to this channel, think about subscribing. There's that red subscribe button down below and if you hit the bell, that way you get notified every time we have a new video coming out and they generally come out on a Tuesday evening, Sydney time. So thanks for watching. I'd love to hear your comments and tips down below and see you next week.